Many believers think of Pentecost as a New Testament event when God sent down the Holy Spirit and the church was born. But Pentecost is actually a biblical Jewish holiday first celebrated by Israel 50 days after leaving Egypt. This is what we're unlocking tonight. How can we understand the spiritual significance of Pentecost in Acts? And how does it connect back to the first Pentecost in the Hebrew scripture? To fully grasp the deeper meaning of Yeshua, Jesus' resurrection and ascension, as well as the gift of the Holy Spirit, we must understand Pentecost throughout time and take a close look at the meanings behind this day. Let's unpack that right now on Mysteries of the Messiah. The revelation of God on Mount Sinai occurred 50 days after the children of Israel were freed from Egypt. But the question is, why did God wait 50 days until he gave the children of Israel the Ten Commandments? 50 in the Bible is associated with freedom. Think about the year of Jubilee. Every 50th year in the land of Israel, debts were forgiven, indentured servants were set free, and land that had to be sold because people owed a debt, that land was restored to them. 50 was the year in which the priests were released from their service in the temple. God waited 50 days because in Jewish thought, the children of Israel had fallen to the 50th level of impurity. They had been so impacted by the idolatry and immorality of Egypt that on each of those 50 days, God was purifying them and setting them free so that they could be renewed and transformed. And what God did for Israel, he ultimately wants to do for you and me even to this day. The day God gave the Ten Commandments is known as Shavuot in Hebrew, but also in the New Testament as Pentecost. So on the same day God gave the Holy Spirit, He also gave the Ten Commandments. We have to understand the connection between these two to fully understand what God was doing in the book of Acts on that day. When God comes down on Mount Sinai, He gives the Ten Commandments. But why were there 10 commandments? Why weren't there eight? Or why weren't there 12? What's so significant about the number 10? You better believe if there is a number in the Bible or a detail, it's there for a reason and it's really significant. Well, the number 10 connects all the way back to creation. In the very beginning, when God created the world, he spoke 10 times and the world came into being. This is known in Jewish thought as the 10 utterances. So 10 is connected to creation. But then 10 is also connected to redemption. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought 10 plagues upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians because they hardened their hearts. But there's something deeper here, right? Think about it. In the very beginning, when God spoke 10 times, it was those utterances that brought order out of chaos. God's word is literally woven into the very fabric of creation. And it says he holds all things together by his word. When Pharaoh disobeyed the word of God, what happened? The world of Egypt and of the Pharaoh went from a state of order to a state of chaos. In the beginning, God brought order out of chaos, but when Pharaoh disobeyed the word, he brought chaos out of order. In the beginning, there was light, but in Egypt, as one of the plagues, there was darkness. God brought life to the first men and women, but there's death of the firstborn in Egypt. God created the world for blessing, but Egypt experienced cursing. God put the fear of man in the animals, but in Egypt during the plagues, the animals had no fear and they attacked the human beings. Wow, think about this connection for a moment. In Hebrew, the Ten Commandments are called the Aseret Devarim, the Ten Principles or the Ten Statements. They are different from all the other 603 commandments in the Torah because literally they form the foundation out of which all the other commandments come. And they were meant to form the foundation for the children of Israel to create an ethical, moral, and just society. And that's still true to this day. That's why so many courthouses in the United States have the Ten Commandments hanging on their wall. 
The 10 commandments were meant to be 10 steps to spiritual freedom. They were meant to help Israel enter into the fullness of God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and help them walk in the blessing of God. In the same way in the very beginning, God created out of the chaos, the 10 plagues on Egypt represent that same chaos. And God speaking the 10 commandments is like God speaking in the very beginning, bringing order out of that chaos. This is a direct mirror of what happens in the creation story. When the erection was presented to the Israelites, 50 days after escaping Egypt, they were given a path forward. The Ten Commandments and the law as a whole was incredibly detailed. Diet, social practices, spiritual practices, and much more is all covered. This specificity can look a little daunting today. After all, how is God's law freeing when it offers so much instruction. This is perhaps an obvious question today, but for the Israelites newly freed, it may not look the same. This is a people barely more than a month out of generational forced labor, and understanding what that does to someone might give us a peek into the beauty of the law. We have no way of truly empathizing with the Israelites' thought process back then. But, unfortunately, slavery is still happening today. This gives us scientific insights and reveals the impact that slavery has on a person. A 2015 survey of trafficked people reveals that more than 60% of these survivors were left with depression, and almost half reported symptoms of PTSD. These rates of mental health challenges far exceed the general population. This was a survey of 1,000 people, but we have more comprehensive insights as well. A United Nations study of modern slavery in sub-Saharan Africa revealed some bleak facts. Enslaved peoples have almost no control over their basic needs, like food and shelter. The team responsible for this study stated that, year after year, this has an enormous impact on an individual's sense of self, autonomy, and ability to relate to and trust others. Clients that I have worked with have struggled to make even simple decisions after years of having no control. Choice seems alien. People often lose their own sense of free will when subjected to slavery. In many cases throughout history, this trauma was so powerful that people freed from slavery would end up under the control of their captors again. Having choice and freedom can be paralyzing for a population that has no idea how to navigate it. When God provided a path forward for the newly freed Israelites, we can only imagine the pain, real lasting effects that were affecting them. The question then remains, how should this affect our view of the law? I'm standing here in Jerusalem and you can feel the excitement. You can hear the sounds of the city. It's so alive, even the sirens and the music. And right over my shoulder is the Temple Mount and the Southern Steps where the day of Pentecost in part took place. Can you imagine? the sound of roaring, booming thunderstorm. And then there's fire that descends from heaven and foreign tongues that are being spoken. The first time that I read that, I was like, what the heck is going on? I was like a new believer and this seems so crazy to me. But then I realized that what happened in Acts chapter two on Pentecost 
was actually connected to the first Pentecost. The first Pentecost took place when God came down on Mount Sinai and spoke the Ten Commandments. Think about it for a moment. The booming thunder in Acts chapter two connects to the thunder and the lightning at Mount Sinai that literally shook the mountain. The fire that descended in the upper room is connected to the fire of God that descended with his presence onto Mount Sinai. Even the cleft tongues of fire, as we'll see in a moment, connects back to what happened at Mount Sinai. It's so incredible when we understand the connections here. We have to understand that what happened in Acts chapter 2 was literally a second Sinai. It was not the first Pentecost, but it was the second Pentecost in history that changed everything. Think about it for a moment. When the Jewish people went into exile, they began to speak primarily Aramaic. And there were these ancient Jewish translations of the scriptures known as the Targumim. Targum means translation. And so that the people could understand the scriptures, they translated it into Aramaic. And these translations were not just a literal translation, but they added interpretation to it. And when we read about this in Targum Neophyte, this is how it describes what happened at the first Mount Sinai experience. It says, out of God's mouth came a fire on the right, a torch of fire on the left, and it literally flew forth and then flew back and inscribed the words of the Ten Commandments on the two stone tablets. This is the same language almost as what we read in Acts chapter two with the cleft tongues of fire hanging over the disciples' head. Why is this so significant? Because this was to be the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 31. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not like the one I made with their ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, but I will write my words upon their mind and I will inscribe it upon their hearts. At the first Pentecost, God wrote the words with fire on two stone tablets, but this was something greater. God was now writing it indelibly on the hearts and minds of his people so that it would never be erased. Wow, God is so good. He's so faithful to his people, to his promises. This is such a gift, the word of God and the spirit of God. God provides Moses and the Israelites with the Ten Commandments soon after being freed from captivity. This was centuries of slavery, a slavery that Israelites were born into. The United Nations report on slavery in sub-Saharan Africa discusses the effects that this has on young people. They say, High rates of mental health problems have been found in adults and in children. In children, the psychological literature tells us that early experiences of trauma are more catastrophic than when experienced by an adult. This just illustrates how deep some of the scars left by Egypt were. Not only were the Israelites escaping forced labor and the place that had shaped their perception of culture, but the Egyptian paganism informed their entire view of spiritual existence. These effects had to compound, creating an unimaginable challenge. Across modern studies of slavery, two aspects of a person's psyche seem to be harmed almost universally, self-confidence and trust. This appears as clear as day for the Israelites in Exodus 14, 11 to 12. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. This is a moment where the conditioning and trauma bred in captivity 
revealed itself amongst the people that had finally escaped their oppression. The Israelites began to question the authority of Moses. Their path seemed directionless and dangerous. Now, let's take a look at the law that God provided the Israelites. It was specific, detailed, logical, clear-cut. The laws of Israel provided longevity, cleanliness, and digestible ways to gain closeness with God. The religious practices of the law, like sacrifice, could be understood by someone who had only seen Egyptian paganism. The law wasn't just a set of restrictions. It was a path, a path given to a group of newly freed people. We would come to see later where this path would lead healing. Healing through the power of a redemptive God, a God who cared to see life flourish from even the darkest places. Two of God's greatest gifts were given on the exact same day, Pentecost in Hebrew, Shavuot. We know in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit was given But what many people don't know or remember is that on that same day, God came down on Mount Sinai and spoke the Ten Commandments, and it's known as the day of the giving of the Torah, Zman Matan Toratenu in Hebrew. But the question is, why does the Spirit of God and the Word of God happen on the same day? And I think it's very significant because think about it for a moment. How did God create the world? The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep and God spoke and the world was transformed from chaos into order, from darkness into light. In the same way creation came about by His Word and His Spirit, in the same way new creation comes about by the Word of God applied to our lives and empowered by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Spirit of God. And we see this in the life of Peter. Peter was full of the Word, right? He had spent three and a half years studying at the feet of the master teacher and rabbi, Yeshua Jesus, right? But at the death of Yeshua, Peter winds up denying the Lord, locking himself in the upper room, scared to be seen, But then seven weeks later on Pentecost, he gets up in front of all the religious leaders, everyone in Jerusalem, and preaches a fiery Pentecost message, and thousands believe, 3,000 for that matter. That's what happens when the Spirit of God comes upon us, when we're filled with the Word of God. It not only changes us and transforms us from the inside out, but it makes a huge impact on the lives of those that are around us. Rabbi Jason, I have a question. So how do we utilize both the Word and the Spirit in my everyday life? The Word of God is the weapon that the Lord has given us, right? Yeshua overcame the temptations of the enemy by literally quoting the scripture. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So knowing God's word is so important because going even back to the fall, the way it happened is the serpent got Eve to doubt God's word. Did the Lord really say? So when we know the truth, it helps us overcome the lies. When we believe lies, we empower the liar and we are taken captive to those lies. But when we can answer with the truth, it sets us free and gives us a real freedom. And that's why it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind because the greatest weapon is the truth. And there's so much misinformation and so many lies and falsehoods that are coming at us that we have to know the truth in order to combat, to be transformed, to have the wisdom we need to walk out God's will for our life. And so it's just so significant. But at the same time, we need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit 
illuminates the scriptures for us. It gives us deeper insight, deeper revelation. It shows us how to apply the word in a very timely way to our situations and our circumstances. And it also empowers us to be able to walk out what God asks us to do. Rabbi Jason, there's so many different beliefs about the Holy Spirit, depending on what denomination you are in, what church you might attend. How can we know the true Spirit is speaking to us? How can we determine that it is the Word of God and the voice of God and not something else? Yeah, I think that's so important. I mean, I think the first thing that we need to really understand is that we should not be afraid of the Holy Spirit. There are some people that are afraid of the Holy Spirit. And the reality is that everyone who believes in Yeshua Jesus as the Messiah is filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you don't have the Spirit in you, you're not saved. Because as soon as you believe, the Spirit of God comes in you and begins to indwell in you and begins to regenerate and transform you taking your spirit from being dead to being alive in Messiah. So that's the foundation to understand the work of the spirit. And you know, we love to throw around this word spiritual in our culture. Well, I am spiritual, or, you know, but the reality is what spiritual actually means biblically is that it is a life that is controlled by the spirit. So when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're operating in the Spirit, in large part, it means that we're yielded to the will of God, to the Word of God, and someone who is spiritual is gonna bring forth this fruit of the Spirit. It is a character thing because many people think being filled with the Spirit is associated with service to God or miraculous sign gifts. Listen, the first thing it is, is character. It's that fruit in your life. It's how you're treating people. It's the Spirit of God is going to give you the wisdom and power to overcome the sin in your life, the struggles in your life. It's going to lead you uh, into truth, and it's going to bring you into greater intimacy with the Lord. And so these are all aspects of what the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit always magnifies and lifts up the name and person of Jesus, Yeshua. So if it's glorifying to Yeshua, then you can believe that it's from the Spirit. And then I think another key thing is, you know, because what we're talking about is when we think about the Spirit is how do we discern between the Spirit of God and the really the voice of God and other voices, right? Because we have God's voice, we have the voice of the enemy, we have the voice of the world. We have our own inner voices, the voices of those that are around us. And I think what we have to understand is that the nature of God's voice is to build us up. It's never to beat us down. There might be conviction, but there's never gonna be a sense of you're worthless, you're no good, you're not valuable. That's the voice of the world, the flesh, or the enemy. The voice of the Lord is always gonna guide, convict, build up, and strengthen you in your inner person. How do we balance the Word and the Spirit and still maintain a healthy relationship with Christ? Yeshua says He's looking for individuals to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I think it's significant because I think as we read and meditate and study the Word of God, it grounds us, it roots us. There's a rootedness that comes. So when the storms of life come, we're not blown away because we're rooted and grounded in the Word, we're rooted and grounded in the truth. But at the same time, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and seeking the Holy Spirit. And I think we have to balance in part the word and worship. Some people are more mind or intellectual. 
head focused and some people are more heart focused, but there needs to be this clear connection between the head and the heart. Because oftentimes it's worship and prayer that brings the Spirit of God. The quickest way into the presence and into the Spirit is through worship and prayer. And when we're worshiping and praying out of a place of passion, love, devotion, not just rote, not just a rote prayer or a rote singing of words or even kind of a rote reading of the Bible, right? Because the Bible can be a dead book if you don't have the presence, power, and passion of the Spirit behind it. So it makes it come alive. So the two are complementary, and I think we need both working together in our life, this balance of word and worship, of study and of prayer, and of taking time to literally, even as we're opening the Word of God and we're reading it and getting the context of it and the meat of it, I think there's a point even in our study where we stop and we say, Lord, show me, what does this mean for my life right now? What do you want me to get from this right now? Speak to me from your word. Or maybe it's just as we're going about our day and we just say, Lord, you know, I love you, you know, just, just speak to me right now, show me something and let the Lord just meet you where you're at. And I think this kind of uh, combination of having some structure, but also being spontaneous with God and with the Spirit really brings just great uh, joy and transformation and life to us.